Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're here for the first of two Clarkson Chair events this year. The Clarkson Chair has a long-standing tradition in our school of bringing outstanding scholars and practitioners to us for more than one, two, or sometimes three, four, or five days. They become part of our faculty during that time and part of the kind of ongoing exploration, in this case, of what it means to be an architect and how we think about architecture and cultural making in our time. For that end, I'm just here to say it's the Clarkson Share Week, and we are blessed with the attendance of Nan Clarkson. That is part of the group, uh, a group of two, that have historically supported our programs here. Uh, the other was Will Clarkson, who passed this year, and we have uh, a hole in our heart for that. But Will was a faculty member here from the moment he didn't retire, but changed work. He was one of those uh, dear supporters of ours who was in almost every planning faculty meeting, always with just the right family of questions. And he has been mentor to four generations of Dean. And so for that, we feel the loss and we are deeply appreciative of the way in which his gift and your gift, man, now takes us further into the future of our fields. So thank you for joining us, man. I'm going to turn it over to um, uh, uh, Eric and Oze. Professor Oze is hosting our Clarkson Chair. He will introduce him and we'll get on with this. Thank you. Good evening, everyone, um, and welcome. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome Rahul tonight. Um, Clarkson Week and Clarkson uh, lectures are essential cornerstones, I think, uh, of the intellectual life of the school and the city. Uh, so if you have had high expectations coming to this lecture, uh, I would let you know that you were right to do so. Uh, at the risk of raising the stakes higher, I remember one of the gripping lectures that Rahul gave a few years ago, uh, which was the only lecture I attended where the audience collectively and audibly gasped at the beauty of one of your images, uh, representing this incredible transformation uh, of Amer. Um, so just a couple of, just a brief uh, biographical note so we can get that out of the way. Uh, Rahul Mehra just studies uh, at the School of Architecture Ahmedabad and graduated with a master's degree in urban design with distinction from the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Apart from his engagement with the design of buildings, Mehrodra has been actively involved in civic and urban affairs in Mumbai, having served on commissions for historic preservation and environmental issues with various neighborhood groups. He was the executive director of the Urban Design Research Institute, UDRI, uh, where he is now a trustee and has taught at the University of Michigan and at the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at MIT, previous to his current post at the GSD. Merutra has written and lectured extensively on issues to do with architecture, conservation, and urban planning in Mumbai and India. His writings include co-authoring uh, uh, co Bombay, Bombay uh, The Cities Within, which covers the city's urban history from the 1600s to the present. He has also co-authored Conserving an Image Center, a seminal, seminal study leading to the designation of the historic fort area in Mumbai, a conservation precinct in 1995, the first such designation in India. In 2000, he edited a book for the UIA that earmarks this, uh, the end of the century and is titled The Architecture of the 20th Century in the South Asian Region. Merutra also has edited the first of the three books that document the 2004 Michigan debates on urbanism, and in 2011 he published Architecture in India since 1990, which is a reading of contemporary Indian architecture. So you will note that I have not yet even talked about his buildings and master plans in this intro introduction. It is incredibly difficult to introduce such a prolific and accomplished figure, and my futile attempt in the next few minutes won't do much justice. Uh, Raul's practice, research, and teaching span the scale of buildings, city bits and chunks, urban regions, and even broader regions. His critical observations, advocacy, and leadership help ground crucial and exemplary mechanisms of planning, land use, and preservation. In an age where, where architects are put on defense to articulate the virtues of uh, generalist practice, Raul Meirotra gives us a compelling case of how the labor of architecture provides a potent lens to view and understand the world, 
represent and interpret it beyond the limitations of rhetorical constructs, and most importantly, cultivate pluralist frameworks to intervene in it. Writing almost 30 years ago as a young architect, like many of you in the audience, he was already aware of the importance of this generalist project. Confronting and trying to make sense of the rapid urbanization of Indian metropolises after the 1960s, he expressed suspicion in the ability of narrowly defined policy measures and conventional research methodologies to represent the complexity of the city. Much of what had been done to understand and shape this emerging urban landscape had long ignored the importance of images and collective forms capable of holding the city itself and its citizens together. Bridging, linking, and negotiating distinct projects and disparate sets of data required the agency of a generalist who could competently move between scales, modes of city making, and understand the multiplicity of time scales that characterize the contemporary urban phenomena. So perhaps it would not be too, an overreach to cast the notion of negotiation as one of the central tenets of his work, a concept as convincing as the notion of Gregotti's idea of modification, which lacked the expanded horizon of Rahul's practice, which is highly pluralistic and discursive. Today at his lecture, and in the next couple of days, during his seminars, we will be treated to hearing about his formidable vision that confronts unproductive binaries, such as formality, informality, intervention, and preservation, we will hear about the detriments of uncritically adapted paradigms, such as the primacy of permanence in architecture, and we will also see the examples of his built work that reveal and sensitively highlight the universal commonalities of how we inhabit the world. Please join me in welcoming Raul Merotra, 2018 Nanam Clarkson Chair in Architecture. Thank you very much, Erkin. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Nan Clarkson. Uh, really an honor to do this, and very generous of you to have invited me, and I really look forward to the three days here and to see many friends I've known for a while in the audience and who I hope I'll meet and spend time with. I've never done a lecture where there's sort of a popcorn vending machine outside, so I'll try to make it as good as the movies. <laughs> so uh, what I'm going to share with you today is uh, my work and my relationship with the city of Mumbai and how that has actually propelled me to think in the ways I'll share with you. Uh, my concerns um, and, you know, my practice is really a triangulation, I believe, between architecture, urban design, conservation, and a very deep interest in landscape uh, architecture. And Mumbai is a place where architecture is not even the spectacle of the city. So when you as an architect or urban designer want to engage with the city, you're confronted with a challenge to start with. Architecture is not the spectacle. We have many other spectacles like these great festivals. So I call it the kinetic city in this way to blur the binary between the formal, the informal, the temporary, uh, and the static city, uh, and all of that. Uh, this diagram explains my city. This is called the five stages of squatting. This guy's at the third stage of squatting, uh, and it uh, slowly becomes part of the paraphernalia of the city. This happens all over the place. Uh, ordinary Mumbai street, uh, when we have the Ganesh festival, the street transforms into a community hall. Uh, that's made of plaster of Paris. Uh, it's done there for 10 days. It goes back to the street after 10 days. It dissolves into the thin air. Uh, similarly, these wonderful I mean, Brian Carter will get this, uh, this wonderful Indian game that the British invented, cricket. Um, these cricket maidans that you see everywhere, but in the evenings they become venues for weddings. Uh, and the cricket pitch is what no one touches because that's sacred space. Uh, the wedding wraps around it, but on a kind of temporal scale and disappears in the morning. This is completely different from a landscape, and I've spoken a lot about this. I call this the landscape of impatient capital. Capital is intrinsically impatient. It has to realize its value. And that's why places like Shanghai, Dubai, which offer no friction to capital and its realization, have become what we are celebrating as architects because we see these twisted, turned forms. And this is the brittle urban form, but this is the landscape of impatient capital, which is what. Um, has come to represent what we are unfortunately celebrating. So what I'm doing is this talk is dividing it into two parts. I'm going to keep sharing with you thoughts, thoughts that sort of uh, I confront every day in time in terms of how one can respond to as architects. And then the second half, I'll show you five or six projects and leave the connections uh, to you. For me, I think one of the issues that 
my generation, but more the next generation, is going to face is the question of equity and social justice. Uh, and it's going to become more and more important. We're already seeing that. Because besides the disruptions that globalization has caused, it is the drive of capital that we all know that is detrimental to the values we've tried to bring to our environments as architects. We struggle with this. Uh, and impatient capital in these landscapes is what is what I call vendor-driven autonomous objects, in a sense. Uh, actually, the architect's role is very minimal here. And to my mind, it's clear that this free-running capitalism will never help resolve this inherent contradiction about our aspirations to create green buildings, sustainable societies, and socially inclined human environments, while as architects, we are simultaneously pandering. We almost have no choice to capital and the forms that it demands. <clears throat> Uh, hmm. a spatial inequity is critical. And this image shows you the Trump Tower in Mumbai, which is gilded in gold. Uh, it's under construction, and it's actually happening as we speak. Uh, and for me, this is the ultimate, it's symbolic of that ultimate disruption. And this is all intended to be lifestyles in Mumbai, if you can even imagine that. And I've just shown you images of what Mumbai deals with. Uh, because today, the amount of urban space, you know, we are right now, we are at a moment we are obsessed with a good life. We are not discussing good society. This binary is going to be really problematic and a challenge for us as architects. Because today, the amount of urban space one controls is directly proportionate to one's status or income. It has no connection to actual family size. In fact, poorer people often have larger families. And this space differential, therefore, cannot be justified. Uh, we have the, we have, you can measure in human terms or in economic ones. Uh, but equity is not a quantitative measure. It also has a subjective dimension, and I think that is a dimension of access. What does access mean? Sometimes perceived as access, which is direct access, or an illusion, perhaps, of equity, uh, which is what we as architects might be able to achieve. You know, for example, plot division in the city, the very fabric of the city is a great contributor to this, and thus, by extension, the architecture that we make, sometimes by default, and not knowing that we're perpetuating inequities just by the form we are engaging with. So what is the role? that we can play as designers? I think this becomes a very important question. And of course, the related questions are land contestation, spatial justice. I mean, we define it this in, 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 in many terms. This is sort of the opposite, and this is a project I'll come back to. Uh, it's a project for a corporate office that we've done. And Martha Chen, who works with informal economies, and I quote her now, uh, and I use this emblematically to drive uh, our aspirations in the project, and what Martha Chen said, and she advocates, and to quote her, what is most needed, most fundamentally, is a new economic paradigm, a model of a hybrid economy that embraces the traditional and the modern, the small scale and the big scale, the informal and the formal. What is needed is an economic model that allows the smallest units and the least powerful workers to operate alongside the largest units and the most powerful economic players." Unquote. And so by extension, the discussion about sustainability, for example, you know, it, it comes down really to a chemical or a mechanical fix to a problem. We design the dumbest boxes, and then we are fixing it chemically or mechanically, more efficient fans, uh, triple glazed glass, etc. And there's a whole green industry that is perpetuating this narrative. And so if you, if you think about it, it's fundamentally wrong, and we spring from it. And so the crucial questions that are absent, I think, in this discussion have to do with spatial arrangements. We don't actually, there is no quantification of the success of spatial arrangements. How do you make space a social condenser, an armature to foster and facilitate social connection? Not hard thresholds that separate, but softer thresholds that allow these kinds of transgressions. And so here the human dimension, at least in my observation, is totally absent in these debates, and that's frightening. The other issue I think that is of great interest, and there are many, but I just want to flag these two, uh, is pluralism and coexistence and what that means. We talk about diversity. But you know, I think diversity has to take the form of pluralism, because pluralism is about coexistence. Uh, and it's inevitable in a democracy that we have to confront this. Uh, these are about collisions between differing forms of urbanism in close adjacencies, thus dissipating these polarities and softening thresholds in these kind of cases by default, uh, where you see this 
this kind of disparate uh, urbanism that kind of plays out. And the questions that come to mind, at least to me as a designer, is can borders be deconstructed and softened? Can boundaries be dissipated spatially? Could this become the basis for a rational discussion about coexistence? Or is the resulting urbanism inherently paradoxical? Is the coexistence of these deferring forms of urbanism and their respective states of physical utopia in dis and dystopia inevitable? Can spatial configurations of how this simultaneously occurs be formally imagined? Or is it just inevitable that cities be molded in a singular image where architecture is that singular, remarkable spectacle of the city? So these become, I think, fundamental questions that also kind of drive our research. Uh, work <clears throat> and uh, you know there's a lot, but I'm going to go through this part fast because I'm going to discuss this in the in the following seminars. Is just basically what it is urban. So you know, for example, in India there are three criteria that sort of define what is urban. That means a place has to have a population over 5,000 people. You have to have a density of 400 people per square kilometer. Greater Houston has a density of about 280 people per square kilometer. So this is very high, and 75% of the male population. Has has to be in non-agricultural employment. This is a kind of bizarre thing. And these three criteria is what gives you the definition of a city, which means that then you have a municipality, you get funding from the center, you have institutional structures that deliver what an urban place uh, might need, need, or a town or a city. And as a result of this, we have about 7,500 towns defined and recognized in India. And so when you see a map of urbanization in India, you see that. Uh, the big dots give you the sizes of the towns, but these are the 7,500 towns. But if I use just the criteria of 5,000 people, I get this kind of pattern. It's close, but they, it's much more nuanced in terms of seeing aggregation. So the question is, how do we spatialize this, which is what we can do as architects. But if I look at the other two criteria, which is density, it's a completely different map of urban India. This is the world's largest mega city. It's contiguous urbanization. It is 200 miles wide or more, and about a few thousand miles long. It is truly the world's biggest mega city, because it's way over 400 people per square kilometer in terms of density. And it's a completely different reading of urbanization. If I take the criteria of 75% of the male population in a settlement in non-agriculture uses, very little is urbanized in India. Because these folks in the mega city are actually doing agriculture for more than six months of the year. And so how does one even begin to map and understand what is urban? So if I use the, if I use the criteria of just 5,000 people per settlement, you know, which is what needs a school, a clinic, uh, infrastructure. India has over 32,000 towns, which means about 23,000 towns or 25,000 towns don't even register in our government's imagination as urban people, which means they have no services. So it's an amazing time bomb that we are sitting on in that country. But what that tells us is the qu what is going to characterize urbanization is flux. I think the idea of flux, where you're gonna, you know, you're gonna have 300 million people, or you have. 300 million people in India, which is the population almost of the United States, that move between the city and village through the year. So that is the kind. So which means you know, the whole imagination of the urban has to be completely different in terms of accommodation. And so that's got me interested in looking at the notion of ephemeral urbanism, and this is again a project I'm going to do a lecture about tomorrow, which is a mapping of the Kummela, where it was an interdisciplinary project between different schools at, at the university, all the way from public school to religion to architecture, uh, and we went and mapped this mega city, which doesn't even exist as a territory during the monsoon, and after the rains recede, a whole city is built to accommodate 7 million people with 120 million people who visited over 55 days for that festival. So this is going to be a whole lecture. I'm not going to go into it. This is a before and after. One month before when the waters recede, this is built in six weeks after I took that image from the same spot. That is the scale of this. Uh, it's, it's really the largest congregation of humanity. Even the governance structure works in a very complicated temporal scale. It shifts. You know, often in cities, we worry about our buildings that we are stuck with. As a, but the institutions in a city are perhaps more permanent than the physical fabric. And often that is 
problematic in the way you can actually adapt cities for the contemporary. So this is going to be the things that I'm going to talk about. But from that, we led to a project where we looked at a taxonomy of ephemeral landscapes around the world, looking at about 300 cases. Again, I'll talk about this in detail. And how do you create a taxonomy to understand this? And the book, which I call Does Permanence Matter? It's about ephemeral urbanism. And it basically challenges the idea that in architecture schools and pedagogy and planning, permanence is a default condition. Uh, we don't have time as part of our imagination. And so how do we challenge ourselves to do that? Now, the reason I've shown you all of this is because I think, I think the crisis in the profession today is that we have articulated our spheres of concern much more finely than actually our spheres of influence. And these don't intersect. And I think this is the crisis for me in the profession, that our spheres of concern, we talk about climate change and public health. We can talk about how the whole planet, we soon start talking about the universe. But we, our influence is so limited that we don't know how to make this intersect. And I think this, again, becomes, I think, it's the big challenge. And for this, I think research has to become integral uh, to any practice. And so we've sort of been really engaged in this. But some of it is scholarly, but some of it is what I call instruments of advocacy. And I'm going to pick a few books out of this, which became actually instruments for advocacy, which range from looking at the history of Mumbai to doing walking tours, to looking at the history of the railway system, to looking at a World Heritage Site as instruments by which we could actually then act and and expand the sphere of our influence with the government, with constituencies that we built, with citizens in these areas. And that's how we, what um, uh, can re refer to, bought in the first um, uh, uh, urban heritage conservation uh, legislation um, uh, in India. And again, I'll talk about this in detail, but also from that going into actually upgrading areas as urban conservation, and also talking about intervention within historic districts and trying to create this kind of tension between the contemporary uh, and uh, the historic. And again, this will be the third lecture, which I'll sort of expand. But also architecture, and coming more squarely to it, this is a book that, again, Ed can refer to which got translated into an exhibition called The State of Architecture, Practices and Processes, which revealed a whole lot of stuff which became really interesting. And I just, I mean, this is a lecture in itself, but you know, I just wanted to, I was speaking to someone earlier about the schools of architecture. We had one school of architecture at Independence, uh, and now we have 450 schools of architecture. So this is the listing of the schools of architecture uh, by decade. Uh, and what you see here is a blue line, uh, which you see growing. That is the growth of real estate, which real estate gets established more formally, as you see here uh, in 90s when we actually open up our economy. And the growth of schools is directly proportionate to the growth of the organized real estate sector. And this is actually totally untrue because architects don't have many jobs in India. Because when the real estate sector organizes itself as around the world, it actually employs less architects. Because one developer builds a township employing one architect and housing 2,000 or 5,000 people, which in the old paradigm would have been disaggregated and given work to architects. So actually, uh, the, the school, the, it should be inversely proportionate to the growth of real estate. So we're going to have lots of jobless architects, because there is just no demand from it, because the real estate sector is controlling most of the building activity. We extended this now into an exhibition called The State of Housing, uh, which uh, just got over a few months ago, where we focused squarely on housing and the role of the architect. And so I just wanted to share this bit with you because I think we talk about uh, the practice of architecture. This is where we focus our discussion, even in, in pedagogy. But really, it, what is the architecture of practice? What are the modes of engagement? How do we empower ourselves in terms of the agency with which we would? And I think that's where the discussion should be. And you know, I think someone asked me earlier about pedagogy and reflecting about that. And I think for me, this is completely, it's absolutely Absolutely fundamental to have diverse models of practice. What is the architecture of practice going into the future? Not the practice of architecture. We know what that was, what that is all about. And so, one of the things I've been sort of thinking about uh, is in just my own reflection uh, about um, uh, uh, practice is um, that. I think the way we organize our practices, and therefore the architecture practice is important, is um, what is that 
you know, across the design profession, there is frustration tied in our attempts to engage with this sphere of concern versus the sphere of our influence. And our sphere of influence is limited also by how we are trained as architects and how, how wide our spectrum is in terms of engagement and agency. Uh, and entire disciplinary practices are, I think, in danger of dissipating because they can't move beyond expressing and representing these concerns because they're not concerned with how you make it instrumental just through that whole motion. But most important, these narratives illuminate the narrow circumspection of our of architects of our territory of operation in the business as usual model of practice. It also sheds light on ways to better understand the site as mediated through and embedded within a larger scale, uh, a la larger spectrum and scale of economic, social, and political processes. And through this broader scope, I think designers can potentially have a far, a much more far-reaching, progressive social impact beyond the immediate sites of our project. Therefore, in in using the city as a generator, and for me that's why Mumbai becomes important for our practice, understanding the meta-narratives that are crucial in situating the practice in a broader landscape is critical. And I borrow my colleague Neil Brenner's term here, which he challenged me once when he said, "What? because you know, we talk about context. Uh, and context we read as climate, material, the geography. Some of us are more ambitious and we, we kind of excavate embedded histories of a site and all of that. We kind of trans, uh, trans um, that we intersect disciplines. But he said, what is the context of that context? So how do you nestle the context of your operation within the larger context of these political and social process? And that becomes an interesting way to kind of construct in our minds the way we might engage as, as practice and what might be the kinds of models uh, that might uh, uh, emerge from them and how do we expand the sphere of our influence. And in this, for me, the client, you know, we take this as a very singular entity, what the client is. But in reflection, I've begun to kind of unpack, to use that horrible word, uh, into patrons, operational clients, and users. And I think, depending on the project, these are very, very different. And, and therefore, the way you engage with the project differs when you engage this with this galaxy. So let's say in a weekend house or a single family house, these actually collapse into one. And that's why, you know, that's the least resistance, resistant kind of project for us as designers. And if you look at magazines, they're full of single family homes and homes where we can craft every detail and we cite it very beautifully. That's because these three collapse into one. We are getting our instructions from a singular entity. The aspirations, the protocols, processes are all through one entity. But if you take a campus or a government project, these split. Sometimes the patron doesn't even know the users. The users are not even aware who the patron is and where that project comes from. So the projects I'm going to show you I've kind of organized in, in terms of complexity as far as this configuration goes. I won't get back to it, but you'll actually see those differences, which means your, your mode of operation and engagement changes completely as you operate across these projects. So it's really the patron, the operational client, and the users. So to get into the projects like practices elsewhere, um, this is Mumbai, and young practices like all of us start doing weekend homes in the hinterland of Mumbai. Uh, and this becomes the way we all start our practices. And here, the client is that one entity, and you can do the most sort of beautiful things. Uh, and this is a project I just show because you know what has really happened is you know <laughs> that's the Palladian Villa, which gets its symmetry from the exterior. It's sort of an autonomous object, which sits in a site. Whereas the traditional Indian house is the courtyard house where the ostentation, the symmetry is internalized. And this is a real kind of dilemma because what we are building are things like this in these rural landscapes around Mumbai. And you know, here I always tell this story, and some of you might have heard it. I met the contractor of this house on the boat going across the harbor and asked him who the architect This is actually for a very well known pop star in India. And I said, Who the architect was? And he said, No, no, there's no architect. I'm designing and building it. And then the client gave me an image of the White House. In Washington DC and I'm kind of getting close to that. So this is like high compound walls, beware of dog signs, you know, I mean all of that. But it's an autonomous object and that creates polarization between the rural landscape it's, it, it's, it's situated in, which is often quite poor, uh, and urban elite going and building and isolating their property in this way. So there's no transgression between these, uh, these populations. So one of the houses we did there for a young couple this is the living room. Uh, and what we did here was we said that the living room, because you're going to hardly spend what, six, eight, 12 weekends in a year, 
the rest of the time it gets appropriated by the village. So the caretaker of the house, who's a local villager, can actually use the porch. These light chairs just get put in, the door gets closed, and this porch becomes an offering to the village. Uh, and that way it allows people of the locality to transgress the space. The caretaker gets status because he can invite his friends to hang out with him here, and he knows exactly when the owners are coming, so they clean up and leave. Uh, and also, you know, the roofs collect water. These are their two taps here. I'll just show you an image, which is again open to the villagers to fill their buckets when they need to if they run sort of dry. You see the taps there, that's the portico. And of course, there are bedrooms and things which are secured. They have courtyards. Uh, you don't compromise the architecture. And I, you know, that's quite evident from uh, the images, but I just wanted to kind of uh, surface this underlying social aspiration. Or the second house, which is also in the same locality, which is for a very famous doctor who invented or who discovered drug-resistant TB, uh, and that's his house. And this is a village which will soon encroach to, oh, encroach to it. And again, instead of de designing this large villa, kind of an autonomous object, we kind of convinced him to disaggregate it. So when the village grew around it, the, the fabric would be not very different. And so it basically, the project here was also to show show how a middle class person could incrementally build a larger house. So someone who has just started their career could actually just build that, or could just build that, which is a living room, a courtyard, a kitchen, and a dining space. And then here you come to a lap pool, and a study for the doctor, and a guest room with a shower, and a bedroom suite where the fa extended family can either treat it as one big room or one big house, or close it down into smaller rooms if guests were sort of thing. So it's, so it's really, the aspiration here was two one is to demonstrate how a kind of pattern of incremental growth could be applied to homes like this as a precedent, but also that when the village engulfed this, the, the scale of the house would not uh, be uh, would not be kind of visible uh, in terms of what was around it. So it's sort of fragmented, uh, it's sort of uh, 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 broken in, there are these sort of roofs, a base in the local stone, the windows are articulated in copper, so they kind of filter the light in, and it's a series of courtyards, very simple materials that create connections between uh, these different spaces uh, as you go through it. Uh, this is a lap pool, very discreetly done so that you don't have gardeners and people working in your fields who are also kind of um, gazing at this kind of hedonism that, you know, urban sort of folks tend to engage with uh, when they are on these sort of weekend homes. But it yet allows the transparency of the green, but also climatically it works because it filters light. And this is a bedroom suite which can, it has blinds very discreetly tucked into these sort of uh, details here which come down and they become separate rooms or if the family and the kids are around, you can treat it as like one big unit uh, at that scale, but also to be enjoyed in different climates with heavy rain uh, or not. These are just some sort of details. Uh, the light sort of makes you aware of what time of the day it is because these colored glass lights sort of throw patterns on thing. And then again, the courtyards and their sort of uh, connections. This next project is institutional. It's um, a, a SEPT Amdabad, which is the architecture school. That's a building designed by Doshi, uh, which was the first building on the campus. Uh, and we were, I studied there, and it was really intimidating to be called back to design a building. It was the first non-Doshi building uh, on the site, and so it was really difficult. Now here, the patrons, interestingly, were the Ahmedabad Education Society, which were the same folks who, you know, their grandfathers were the ones who got Cobb and Louis Kahn, so they were aware of architecture. And the clients were all, you know, the, the committee in the architecture school, which were generally people four or five years senior to me, so they were always talking down to me in terms of instruction, because you know they'd seen me in my first year, and now they were established architects, and the users were uh, really the students. And how do you negotiate these three? I was really lucky that I had direct access to the patron, patrons, because I had done some other work for them, so I could create these cross circuits of talking to the students, negotiating with the clients, and going to the patrons to get them to instruct the clients when they needed it. And that actually, I I realized was the only way I could have pulled it off because in an architecture school, I mean, everyone and their uncle have an opinion on how the building should be. And you know, it's the only place where I've been at committee meetings where, you know, usually you're a committee or uh, with a client meeting and they, you, you present your project really passionately and then the client will say, I think the service entrance is too small. 
and you say, oh, no problem, I can solve that, I'll just make it bigger, and you go away quite happy because it's kind of, but if with a committee like this, you would passionately explain stuff, there'd be silence, and someone would say, I totally disagree with the attitude you've taken and the way the building touches the ground. Now, that's a hard one to come back to respond to. So it was that kind of, kind of negotiation that one realized one had to isolate these three groups because each of their kind of inputs, the cultures from which they were coming, would be quite different. And so here, this is the campus. Um, these are, this is the building that Doshi did. We were given the site as part of a master plan, so this is the building we did. We later added a cafeteria, which just got finished. These are the kinds of presentations I had to do, and they were put up on YouTube, and I had alum from Toronto and many parts of the world calling me and arguing about what was right and wrong with the building. So there were many such public consultings, uh, consultations that we had to do with the students. And finally, you know, the program called for a six-story building. And we, we just said that this is for us a conservation project. It's an intervention in a very important, critical, contemporary campus in India. So we took the datum line and said we'd stay six inches below it as a sign of respect. And that forced us to do a building that actually went three floors into the ground. So technically, that was a real challenge, but we had to convert it to our advantage. And that's why, I mean, the challenge was really how, in terms of scale, one could take the heavy program like that and intervene in a, in a landscape which had such a clear image. But also, then, how does one pick up on the materials that are also so well sort of established? And so that's how, that's the diagram of the building and how there were parts that nestled into each other, which I'll come to in a second. And so that's what we finally came up with, a base with a skin that modulated uh, air and light, uh, an inner core, which was the reading areas, and then stacks which went uh, into the ground. And we took light all the way down. This series of courtyards, and I'll show you images, bring natural light all the way down uh, to the stacks. And also it keeps the building very cool because Ahmedabad, it's 50 degrees centigrade uh, in the summer. Uh, and so it was also about, uh, you know, on a campus which is exposed brick and concrete, how does one now in India, there are so many new materials as we've liberalized our economy and students you know, if they, they study in a school like this, they see this kind of pure Louis Kahn and Cobb architecture, and they just can't translate those principles using the newer materials because some of these crafts are not even possible. So part of the agenda of the building was to take every new material in the market almost, from gypsum board to glazing, uh, to all sorts of materials, and to show how they could be sensibly integrated and as an ensemble, uh, as a kind of alternate to that. And so. That's the kind of nature of the building. This part is not even visible. The building sort of sits uh, above there, and that's sort of an image of the building. The louvers are all operated, each one of these panels, so you can modulate uh, the light and the sun. You can adjust it depending on how you need it to be. That's how it relates to the buildings that are around it. We created this big plinth to pick up on all those sort of lines, and that's how you enter the building. So you enter the building through a space that's a void, which is kind of a space that protects the inner core from the rain, from the sun, through these louvers that operate in a series of catwalks uh, that are used to operate these sort of louvers. And there as you see the depth of the building, and these skylights take light further down. So this is already minus four meters, um, you know, which is 12 or 13, 13 and a half feet below the ground level. And then there are two more floors uh, below that. And the entrance is like a common multi-purpose area where students do workshops, there are exhibitions there sometimes, there are reviews. The thesis reviews happen there, uh, and it's absolutely on axis with Doshi's building, so it kind of respects and frames and picks up the entrance to those sort of original buildings, and this is an exhibition uh, in, in, in progress there. So it's a kind of multi-purpose space, it's a walkthrough, uh, because you have three directions where these bridges sort of go, and you kind of, you know, you, you see these sort of reflections. So essentially, what's above ground has this double skin. You have this box which sort of sits there. And then you have the stacks that sit within that. So it's actually three buildings nestled into each other. And each building has its own sectional logic. So the stacks, the building which is the stacks, which is uh, uh, in the core, only has eight feet high ceilings, uh, because that's what you need in terms of being able to reach a book without having to employ ladders and complications. Whereas the outer, uh, uh, the outer building has a sectional logic which is about 3.5 meters, uh, so about a meter and a half more than the inner core. And so therefore you get a sectional, uh, you get a very interesting kind of sectional set of relationships as you uh, move through the building. So this is down 
at the first level, you see the stacks beginning to emerge. These bridges connect you in the four directions. These are the carols, so you get natural light, and you're along the stacks. You can step out if you want to talk, so you don't disturb uh, people uh, who want quieter kind of space. Uh, and this is how, in section, then it begins to work. You kind of see, you simultaneously see four or five different levels. So you get a sense of light. You're situated uh, in terms of your own perception at what level you're at. Uh, and you get light that filters in very gen uh, uh, gently. Uh, but also it's social just in terms of those uh, visual uh, connections. And uh, this is sort of the, the, the two layers. Uh, these are operable. This is a, a, a catwalk with a, uh, a channel here for a harness so people can sort of so it's safe. And the catwalk here is on the outside. And this is what it sort of looks like from the upper level. And so if you go down through the building in section, that's what it sort of uh, feels like. Uh, and that's the ground level. Uh, and then you go below the ground level to the level of the skylights. These are the different bridges uh, that connect you to connect different parts of the campus because it's become kind of pivotal building. And then this is a skylight that takes you beyond uh, into the lower levels of the building. Uh, and that's the kind of light, the changing light that you get on this. And it's all pure concrete once it go, goes below the ground. So uh, you, kind of, uh, you kind of get a finish. Uh, and light reflecting uh, off these surfaces. And here you have these carols, which are floating boxes that sort of sit in and embrace the courtyard. Uh, and there are more points from where you can actually uh, enter the courtyard. Uh, and then these are the kind of lower levels where, again, you have the light and you have corners. The structure was just four portals like this, so there are no beams. And everything else is integrated in the stacks. So this is just sort of a pure concrete shell, barring the wireless sort of router. Uh, and, and, and that's what sort of makes the outer edge. And that's the second building, a third building, which is within. So the first building is that outer edge. The second building is these four portals. And the third building is uh, these eight foot high stacks, which go down four floors. And these are the corners where you can have more quiet um, thing. And when you go up, they, it's much lighter. Uh, there's more light. There's more glass. These are reading rooms, uh, magazine stacks. These are going to have bean bags and other seating arrangements as they go on. But you begin to get a sense of the campus. Uh, and uh, here, you know, these are the louvers, which can be adjusted depending on glare, light, shade, uh, and, and, and all of that. So it sort of takes these basic sort of questions. And we've developed a manual, because now they're going to use the building as a, uh, for, for, as a basis for the class on climate and technology. And the students will operate it for a semester, map the temperature. And this sort of, we've sort of worked out in two languages. Uh, the different settings for each one of these panels for the hour of the day, the month, the week, uh, and so that students begin to understand how to operate this. And it's going to be a required class for a credit that they actually see the building uh, that they use and how it operates. And you know, and I'm already getting interesting feedback uh, about it from students and things. But these are just gives you a section. At night, of course, the transparencies uh, change completely during the day. And the base we've designed as seats, which students inhabit. They have lunch there. They read there. Uh, it's very actively used uh, as a base through which you get glimpses of this inner world uh, through these reflections and the light that changes at night. So then I move to a, a next project, which is in Hyderabad, which is central India, hot, dry climate. Uh, and it's for a corporation. And now here, what happens is a patron and the patron and the user, the operational client, begin to overlap a little bit. The users are the office workers. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, project for us, because those relationships suddenly changed quite dramatically. Uh, this is Hyderabad. This is a high-tech city. That was a site. It was supposed to be a much big, bigger building. We just built one fragment of it. It's actually supposed to be three blocks, or two blocks. Uh, this is a building by Mario Botta, which is clad in brick. And the rest of the buildings here are just glass boxes. Uh, every big corporation from the world, from Novartis to you know IBM, they're all here, and they're these just these incredible glass boxes. And this company actually does infrastructure, and so they also wanted a glass box. They wanted to be a kind of high-tech company. And this is their control room. Every truck, every piece of equipment has a camera. They do highways and other infrastructure all over the country. And they sit here, and they actually, in real time, monitor it. So they had aspirations to do this really high-tech building. In surveying the scene, so this is Mercedes-Benz. This is their showroom, I mean, under another name. But uh, you see the logo right here. And there were all these glass buildings. And everywhere in Hyderabad, which is going through a political problem where they were trying to split the state, uh, these buildings were ideal 
for rioters to stone when there was a riot because they, you know, they were glass buildings. So when the, the when we started talking to about to glass manufacturers, they offered us that they would actually give us a choice of the color of nets and the details to fix nets on the facade so the building could be protected. And that's what everyone does. They do these glass buildings and then they have white, blue, purple nets that protect it. So that itself becomes part of the architecture in a sense. And this I thought was really bizarre because it just told you about how incredibly powerful these images were and what they were associated with in this sort of new globalizing culture uh, and global capital that wanted a kind of predictable imagery to go with it, which is what we are kind of fighting. So we were inspired by something quite different, which is, uh, which is, uh, which is this little hut in Jaipur. And uh, it's, uh, that guy works for the government and a business association. And it's a water cooler. And he's open for business. And people stand by there. They cup their hands. They're not plastic glasses. And they drink water. Uh, and there were 200 of these put up in Jaipur every summer. Uh, and it's only for the period of summer for three months. And every once in a while, he comes out and he keeps the hut humid. So through evaporative cooling, the hut stays very cool. So it's like a little bit of an air-conditioned space. And he keeps, keeps humidifying it till it's cool. And then within the hut, in earthen pots are the clean water. So through evaporative cooling, the water also stays cool. And all he does is a beautiful gesture. He has this beautiful metal brass pot from where he serves people water. They acknowledge it. There's no paper. There's no plastic. It's as sustainable as you can. And it's also very humane and very beautiful. So this became kind of inspirational for us. And we began asking ourselves. We were doing a project in Jaipur which exposed us to this. And the light that came through it, etc. So it made us ask ourselves, how could we do a building inspired by this? And instead of that glass, silly glass box, we came up with a building that was a five-floor high garden. Now, this is not a green wall like you stick green pots on the wall. But this is actually a screen which is humidified through a misting system that acts as a way to keep the facade cool. So the inner, so it's a spec building with this green facade. And this becomes the modulator to keep the building cool. You can control how you open and close the windows. And the humidification is on a kind of computerized system. And so it became a double facade. And you could also then actually play with every facade like you do that aloco bond in different colors, different species, and how they grew depending on which side uh, it faced. So we set up plants and nurseries and began to experiment with it. Uh, and of course, impatient capital, they wanted the building ready in 14 months. So we managed to negotiate three extra years for the facade, to grow the facade. And we gave them the buildings. The cows were bought in. They sanctified the building. They started working there while we took a year to actually make the facade, which was handcrafted in this little shed from a previous contractor we had worked in. And he said the economics of it would work if we only made, he only made one mold, because the mold was very expensive. Uh, and so that meant it would take a year. Because if he had to make 10 molds and do it in three months, it means his investment would be too high to make it economical, which the clients agreed to. And so we handcrafted uh, this in, in this little uh, factory. Uh, let me see this place. It's an interesting process. And, oh, oh sorry. This is a little challenge. Yes. Yeah. And so there was one more. Uh, and it was a small factory with about five or six people. Uh, that's the one mold that was built. It's a heavy piece which costs a lot. And its profile is such that it incorporates the misting system in it. We used recycled sort of aluminum. So it was many textures and colors. But that was interesting. And this was the mold. So the misting system sat in here. The curve gave you a nice light quality. And there were very small panels which two people could make. Women were employed because it was so light, they could actually, this was a very large anodizing tank where this was anodized, it was stacked up, and then in a small truck, whenever enough panels were ready, two people went to site and assembled it uh, on the building. And slowly this sort of aggregated uh, to give us the facade uh, with the plants growing on it. And the misting is only to cool the building. The plants grow through hydroponic trays, which are at every level. So it's very efficient. 
but the misting just sort of creates the atmosphere, but it creates a humidification uh, and a kind of psychological cooling, but also a, 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 a cooling. And these are the conference rooms, which are the only glass boxes that protruded out of the thickness uh, of the facade. And, uh, and the water was sort of recycled and recollected. Uh, and you know, as the plants grow every season, the building looks quite different. And I'll show you some images from the summer when, of course, there are no flowers, but yet it's very thick. Uh, and that's what the misting does. And the, the gardeners who can occupy that space between the facade and the planting are the ones who make patterns and become very operational. And the ornament comes from the shadow of the plants on the plant. That's the world outside. So this is a completely different internal world, uh, but it creates a, a, a completely different atmosphere. And so it becomes a woolly monster, then you've got to give it a haircut, it goes back to that, and you kind of modulate it. And it's a very simple diagram in what it does. And that's the base of the building uh, and, and the facade above it, and there are podiums where people can meet and congregate. It's a very social building. In section, it actually is two buildings because it allows hot air to be extracted. That's the podium. It's very social because uh, the plants become a matter that people observe, and you know it gets thick. That's lemongrass on the podium here. You see different flowers on different facades. Um, and uh, that's how the two sort of sections, which are programmatic, the tendering and the accounts are down there because they kind of need privacy. The rest are much more social spaces and their connection sectionally within the building. And you know, that building got a LEED certificate. We couldn't get a LEED certificate because we hadn't sealed our glazing and we hadn't uh, done double glazing. Uh, so we couldn't get a LEED certificate because the parameters are quite different. Whereas this building got a LEED certificate, and like the walkie talkie building, it has no responsibility to the public public realm, as you can see with that reflection, whereas this one clearly does. And now we are trying to map it. This is about 10 years old now, and I had never mapped it, but friends who are in this business have sort of requested I map it so that we can actually come up with it. And that's what it sort of feels like, the shadows change. And this image I come back to. This is actually a, an intern from Panama City took, so it's not even an orchestrated image. I'll be totally honest about that. And you know, this is what I call a soft threshold. Because um, usually in a corporation like this, you would have a garden. The CEO would drive in their Audi or Mercedes Benz with reflective glass. The gardeners who are the poorest paid in that corporation would not even have eye contact with their bosses. Now the 20 gardeners that look after this building, they can roam free anywhere in the building because this catwalk is their space. And they make eye contact. Uh, they know what's happening in there. Someone can pull a blind down, but that never happens because there's empathy automatically established. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, I think it creates a form of social transgression. And we didn't design with this in mind. This was what we understood as feedback from the building and became a very important lesson for us in many subsequent buildings. So this idea of the soft threshold, for me, this is emblematic uh, of that. And so they are the heroes of the building because as a friend of mine who, again, writes a lot about sustainability, he said these are truly green jobs because the poorest in that corporation are now responsible for the identity of the building. The facade of the building depends on them. They'll always be well looked after because the building and the corporation wants this to be a kind of healthy kind of condition. And you see this kind of co-mingling. These are spontaneous shots, as you can see. I didn't clear the mess of the thing. I just shot it because I realized they are comfortable with that, which itself, in the context of India, is, is, is very important. Uh, this I might just forward because I think you've seen part of it. Um, but you know, just to show you in the summer, we just shot this in the summer, just before the Venice Biennale, I got a friend to take a drone and go through it. And this is like at the heat of summer that it's yet, the flowers aren't there naturally because they won't bloom in the summer. But the whale, the coolness in the building, uh, is it, it yet survives it because the hydroponic trays uh, give it the nourishment that sort of it needs. And so it's a real protection. Uh, and the temperature difference between the outside and the inside because it's a hot, dry climate uh, is, is incredible. So this is, uh, I mean, here the green facade is aesthetic, but it's also performative. It's not just a green facade as sticking something uh, on the facade. That's what it sort of looks like in its context. And then I come to this building uh, in Switzerland, which is our, the only building we've done in Europe. And it was an interesting challenge because 
you know, these kinds of values and principles, how do you begin to operate like that in the context of Europe and Switzerland where, I mean, the, the regulations are mind-bogglingly strict. And so this is the Novartis campus, this is the Rhine River, and it's a campus which some of you might know about where the many architects were built. We were very honored to be invited back from India, and so we did one of the first buildings on the, on the Rhine. Uh, and that's what the campus looks like. It's a very strict grid, which Vittorio Lumpugnani did. He was the urban designer, and they kind of passed it out. The grid. There are many existing buildings, so they kind of worked around it. Uh, our site was that on, on the Rhine, and they were left with a triangle, so they gave it to Frank Gehry, naturally. Uh, and the rest are kind of very, you know, state kind of buildings. Uh, and so that's what the campus looks like, and, you know, that was our building there. And here, this was really interesting because I don't know, maybe thinking socially about a project and thinking about, as I said, our aspiration that how do you make this a social condenser became the foremost thing. Now, the 20 buildings that were built before us by you know, every architect that you've heard of, this was the diagram they were given and this was the diagram they followed, which means this is a footprint because they're all standard footprints, a core with the elevator, ducts, services, two of them put the labs between them, very efficient, put some offices around it so the office guys get the views, the labs are always sort of, you know, in introverted, etc. We argued a lot and we translated this and this is the first building where we disaggregated the shafts completely because we said unless we have a clean footprint, uh, there's very little you can do in trying to co-mingle scientists with administrators, managers, uh, and different social hierarchies that sort of exist there. This was tough in Switzerland, really tough to do it. But they finally agreed and you know they they all backed it and we actually pulled it off. So the elevators are triangulated, those are the shafts for air conditioning and the services, so the labs come there, they're away from the facades, so you get a beautiful veranda where scientists can go out and, and, and write their findings. The other thing we did again, which was a first, was this is the envelope, everyone sort of based on the lab height, so five meters, they kind of stack it and that's it. So the administrator, everyone has 5.2 meters or whatever, might be a 4.8, I, I can't remember. But we said that look for the administrators, you don't need more than 2.4 meters or eight feet. So can we actually have uneven floors? And so we put the labs there, but we had uneven floors here, which means we consume the FAR, allowing us to carve out a large courtyard within the building, which would act as a greenhouse to cool and heat the building, but also create a social space. So those were two, you know, surprisingly, it was a little bit of a battle, but they kind of agreed. And it really stunned me to think, why wasn't, why didn't someone do that before? And I realized, and sorry, this might be a generalization, but it might also be a criticism. And I, because I'm here for two, three days, I'm doing it so I can really be badgered over the next couple of days, is that I think in the Western tradition, because of regulation, climate, many other things, the obsession has very much become the facade. Uh, people aren't, I mean, challenging in business as usual projects like this in the mainstream, sectional qualities, and you know, the, all those beautiful things about architecture, which we all enjoy in the academy, but in the practice it becomes a facade. And so the facades of each one of those buildings on that campus, done by, I think, eight Pritzker Prize winners there, are just, they're basically dumb boxes with beautifully wrapped wrappers, in a sense. And the insides are as boring as you can get, as unsocial as you can get, as scaleless as you can get in some case. A chipper field did a wonderful thing where he used the terrace and he exploded the building in interesting ways. But this kind of fundamental thing, I, I, you know, and I think maybe coming from Mumbai and India where you're always trying to subvert things in an intelligent way because bylaws and there's so many constraints on you that you're trying very hard to weave your way through it, I think maybe we thought about things naturally like this. So that's what the section of the building landed up being with the atrium, the staff areas, a beautiful garden in the center which Gunther Ho, who is a Zurich-based landscape architect, worked with us uh, on. And he actually created a register for the climate, and so there are, I think, 28 species or some such number on this, which sort of bloom, blossom, burn out at different times of the year. So you can kind of register it, and the transparency changes. Those are the stacks, which are the ducts that bring the services down. Uh, the riverside has actually louvers, which in this image, they're all up but they are automated, so they kind of adjust, and we created these two large atriums on the river because the Rhine is such a beautiful view. And the other facade is a green facade, 
which also becomes a veranda. And this is Marquis building, which is right across us. And this is a concrete shaft, uh, which uses the sandstone from Basel mixed into the concrete to give it that very particular color. The ground floor, which you enter through these shafts, and you see labs, you go up a stair. This is a stair. These are installations by Piccolo Tierist, who's an artist who worked with us on video installations. Uh, and then when you come up, you come up here, and the garden is what connects through these intermediate spaces where the scientists and the administrators meet, where they're visually connected. And the garden, actually, most of the conference facilities uh, and requirements of the buildings are actually around the garden. So that's the office which just sort of seamlessly moves into the garden. These decks are actually conference areas. So everyone sits in the garden for their meetings. Their cafe is tucked in there. Uh, these are, again, the garden outside the labs. Uh, you know, their televisions, I mean, their flat screens here so people can actually have have meetings and presentations, uh, and through the from the labs, you through the garden, look at the Rhine and look at the administrative offices. And sectionally, it's very different in terms of the logic between different parts of the building. So you get these kind of plays in the section, and these are all meeting decks. So you actually will see people's heads there if they're sitting there. But we weren't allowed to photograph this with people because of their. Uh, their research and their sort of own rules. But, uh, and you, you walk a lot in the building because there are lots of half levels as a result of this sectional kind of change. And here again, you see it, and that's the facade, that's the Hazan, the Dumuran building that just came up. So these projects, I'm going to go to the last two projects now. So these two projects, in a sense, for me, were about localizing what are essentially global programs. So these are you know, labs and high-tech offices and things. These are we didn't have this in our tradition even as precedents. And so the question is, how do you take global capital and root it in a place? How do you make it more sensitive, not this autonomous box that arrives there? And so really, if I had to summarize it, it was about localizing these sort of global, it's often brash bits of capital that arrive there, and you have to you know, aspire to localize it. The next sets of projects I'm going to show you are very local problems, which are problems which or wicked problems are very, very difficult to deal with. And the question is that how do you not make a caricature of these things? And often that happens. They become caricatures of what we expect these local programs to be, whether we're building in slums or for poorer people, etc. And here I want to use a quote from someone called Pratap Bhanu Mehta, who is an incredible public intellectual. He's a vice chancellor of a university now, I think a sociologist. And he said, and I read this in one of his essays on equity, and I quote him, and he said, in a society driven by deep inequality, there's not even the minimal basis for mutual concern, where social distance makes human beings almost a different species in each other's eyes. Why would you expect anything else? Why would a contractor care if one of his construction workers used his hands rather than a brush to apply a dangerous chemical? The more inequality there is, it is harder to imagine what it is like to be in someone else's shoe. It has to be admitted that even the most well-meaning and sensitive find it hard to imagine what the suffocation, darkness, and sheer physical suffering of being at the bottom of a social hierarchy might really be like. The very thing you would expect to instigate questions of justice makes it hard to even raise them. And so this sort of extreme condition is a very, and actually it, it pushes us into inaction. And there is no moral value in not acting. And so this is like a, a crazy choice, because how do you actually you know, intervene spatially? And, and, how, and therefore, I think I kind of um, guard against it becoming a caricature, because then that is looking down at it. And how do you actually bring the same skills you would if you were working in one of the global programs? And I think that becomes the challenge for us as architects. Again, going back to how we intersect these spheres of concern with our spheres of influence in the way of making these changes. And so this first project is about sanitation. It's an ongoing project. This is an image of Dharavi. This is going to be one of the world's biggest problems, public health. Uh, and because this knows no political boundaries. I often show this image and tell this story. Sorry if some of you heard it. 
This is in Dharavi, this boy, I just took this by accident when I downloaded it on my computer that evening, I had tears in my eyes, because what it made me think was this kid, could be any of our, you know, one of our children, uh, jumped out of Dharavi, look at a white sock, smile on his face, wearing a tie and going to school really proudly, but he probably defecated in the open. He had ac no access to a toilet, because people in the slum don't have toilets. They sit by a channel, like I showed you, and they defecate in the open. And it's absolutely bizarre that someone can be so intact. Uh, and so what is our role in this? I mean, is this not for us? How do we stop open defecation? I mean, this, these are the kinds of places, as you can see that girl sitting there, these are places people defecate. That boy probably defecated here before he changed his avatar and got ready to go to school, and that's the reality. And this is what Pratap Bhanu Mehta was saying. Can we even begin to understand their condition? I don't know, but we have to try. So we've been researching this a lot. This is an ongoing project, which will take many years. But these are kinds of maps we are making. And we discovered India has the highest open defecation uh, in the world, uh, even Africa and many other undeveloped areas that we imagine as being undeveloped don't have the similar kind of problem. And then it comes down to Mumbai. We've broken it down by wards, so you know which districts, etc. These are slightly old statistics, but you know the, the UN Human Development Report says in Mumbai it's one toilet for 1,440 people. Uh, Spark, the NGO, we were doing this project which said it's one to 800. The BMC says one to 150 is like 10 times, 100 times. And the BMC target rate is one is to 50. So they're saying our goal is we'll have one toilet for 50 people. And they feel they'll solve the problem. That means for six families, they'll have a toilet. You'll have to have a lottery system. You'll be lucky if once in a year, your, your luck is on your side, you might be able to use that toilet. How do you monitor something like that? It's completely bizarre. Our prime minister, in this condition of highest defecation has made a, re he said, I'm going to have toilets in every household by 2019. And like, that's amazing. What a kind of goal, you know? And that's why I'm talking about toilets. This has become like a huge campaign. But it's like the worst thought through thing. It's like the worst form of political rhetoric. It's exactly what Pratap Banu Mehta says. It's insulting to even make an ambition like this without thinking it through. And that is because, and we are complicit in this as designers, we think in terms of absolute solutions. And that's then politicians pick that up. Of course, make a factory, two million toilets a month, we'll solve the problem. That's exactly what they're doing. So these are absolute solutions. So this goes back to what I started off with, the idea of flux, where populations are moving like this in India. So one of the big challenges for us to deal with these problems is Pedagogy, uh, that's a question I hope we'll discuss in the next few days, is how do we begin to train people to think about transitions? Because the thinking about design transitions is quite different from thinking about absolute solutions. And this is again where permanence becomes a default condition. So another way of saying why does permanent matter is saying why are we obsessed with absolute solutions and state planning? The transition, sometimes the transition takes you in directions which are seem like bizarre, but they are ways to get to your final goal rather than making the leap to absolute solutions as our prime minister is doing and saying that we've delivered these toilets. I mean, you could not possibly, by 2019, have a toilet for every house in a landscape like that, which is like about 80 or 100 million people in the country. So this is what they're doing. And now studies have showed that no one uses this as a toilet. It's the hardiest thing in the village. So people use it to store grain, jewelry, suitcases. It's like the most reliable storage bin that the government has provided you. And they have to then put septic tanks if there's place, which then overflow. You can't clean them, you can't get the honey wagon in, etc. So it's a complete disaster. A complete disaster. And please be aware of that when you hear these campaigns because it's a lie. So really it's about transitions before transformations and we would have to make the transition really through community toilets. We'd have to create the culture of sanitation. So what do community toilets mean? So this is what they do. They make community toilets like this and becomes these landmark kind of buildings. So this is where we intervened with an NGO that was using only engineers to do this. And we said we should have a broader team. And so we came up with a prototype, uh, which was we use, you know, we, I mean, we were being idealistic as architects. We said we'll have a green facade with flowers. And if people pluck flowers from the toilet and use it for prayer in the morning. What a fantastic, idealistic kind of condition. I mean, of course, it's totally stupid to think like that, but we did. But what we did was we reconfigured this 
in a way that we put the men below, the women above, because women and children have huge safety issues with these sort of community toilets, so that's why they don't use it at all. But what we did was on top, we put the caretaker's house, and the caretaker is usually the lowest caste, so we kind of completely inverted a social hierarchy. And next to the caretaker's house, we created a community space and got through our own lobbying with our private clients, we got solar panels for eight toilets so that it would be off the grid, so women and children could go there to do workshops, adult education, study, because there's not electricity often in this. So it really became, we were trying to blur the toilet in a community center as a kind of configuration. And of course, there were many problems with it, which I'm happy to discuss. We, we started building this one. It was stopped at the plinth level by the government. And they said it's too iconic. And they said those slums, we've actually talked to a developer. We're going to move them out and relocate them. And if you make a building with a community center, they're going to organize themselves. And through architecture, you're empowering a community. And this is not right, etc. So we realized there was all sorts of other perceptions and implications. So we went to a distant site with this NGO. And we said, let's build one impatient architect like impatient capital. And we built one. We got solar panels. It became a community center. Uh, the children enjoyed it very much. Those are just bamboo slats. In the background there, you see public housing, which has been lying empty for 20 years because people don't move there. They get dislocated in terms of their communities. Of course, there's enough literature on that, the solar panels. But then when we went back, like, you know, it, it, it functioned. And when we went back, it had completely failed. It got appropriated as a club by some of the local leaders in that slum. And that, you know, this was a very complicated story about the nexus between politicians, money, grabbing land. And you see a television set to watch cricket matches. You see old, empty rum bottles somewhere. And then the government started building their old prototype. And they kind of abandoned it. And it actually became a space that private people began to use. And so Beckett comes to mind, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. That's that's all you can do with wicked problems. You've got to keep trying. And so I think we kind of did a competition. This was a Gates Foundation thing. We won the first prize. It was an international competition where we did this as a reversible thing, where we felt that's a sign of optimism. The toilet could move and the problem was solved. We embedded it much more. Within the community, we added shops where sanitation stuff could be sold. So we were trying to take this idea of a community center further. But again, that didn't get built for very various reasons. And we also placed it in front of the temple uh, as a kind of provocative gesture that these should be kind of equal, the temple and the toilet. And this didn't get built because, you know, again, the politics of this, because the money involved is very large when you're building so many buildings. This NGO was doing 500 toilets they got money from the government for, and that's a lot of money, and they didn't want interference in terms of the design. And so one is learning. We are yet carrying this on. Now we are studying the broader ecology of delivery. We are zooming out to see where might be the appropriate place for us to intervene. And I'm doing this now through the university, so one is detached from the ground till one is ready uh, to. So I'll come back and report in a few years if I'm successful. I go to the last project, which is probably the most difficult project we've done, and those are our clients. That guy is a mahu who looks after elephants. They are all from the Muslim community. This is in Jaipur in Rajasthan. And that's an elephant that doesn't look like he's in good health. Uh, it's an accident of history that these guys are even in Rajasthan because they came with the Maharajas for pomp and then they got appropriated by tourists. This is an ad from the New York Times. Uh, and it became a big kind of part of representing Indian culture in the last many decades. But in a de these are tropical beings. They need a lot of water. They're in Sri Lanka and Thailand and Indonesia. They should be in Rajasthan. But they happen to be there. And what they do is they take tourists up. They get painted by these, in these toxic colors, which is why their skins are discolored. As you saw there, their skins go white, because they don't have water to wash them. This is where the government was housing them, like cars in a garage. And the mahouts were living up there. But that doesn't work, so the mahouts all move down, because the relationship between the mahout and an elephant is a very complex and close one. Uh, and uh, they, you know, they have to even sing to the elephant to calm it down. And only the mouth can control an elephant. And so there that, the, the spatial relationship there becomes important. There's a competition which we won. That was a site we were given. And what you see in black is all excavated because the sand 
the sand contractors had used this as a quarry, and so it was a completely desolate site, and that's what the government said, you know, allocate this and build it. So, of course, it needed research, water, to understand how and how much water we needed, what our ambitions were. But for us, it became a landscape project, and I think we won it because our whole narrative was about water. We didn't privilege architecture, and I saw the schemes by my other colleagues who had looked at, you know, the traditional stables of the Maharajas and how they might replicate that in a contemporary language. And, yeah, but that was a whole different political, social structure within which elephants were patronized, but this was now they were being looked after the public works department. So you have to think about this differently. So we felt if we got the landscape right, their lives would be improved because of the water. And so we, it was a very hard thing as the impulse of an architect, we want to think through form, to move it to a kind of landscape project. Because I don't have a training in landscape, but of course one has been interested. And that's the site as we got it, and that's what we came up with. So whatever needed water, that was privileged, and in the residual land is where these clusters of housing were put. Uh, this was a, which hasn't been built, was a center, a little guest house. These are some broken houses here we said we should restore. Uh, this was a very early plan. This project started in 2007, uh, and it's just finishing now, and I'll just tell you the story very quickly. So that was the, uh, sorry. That was the site plan as we developed it, and and this is the this is what how we got the site in 2007. The same hill that you see there, and uh, that's how it's been transformed now. And this was just because water had been privileged, and so the transformation is quite mind-boggling. And it's a very complicated story because <laughs> at the point the government appointed us, as soon as we finished this much, the government fell. The new government abandoned the project and that allowed the landscape to generate. We were lucky. At that point I was totally frustrated, but now with a 11 year perspective, that was a great thing that happened. So you know, you begin to think about time differently because our impulses in terms of achieving something are different. And now of course it's evolved quite naturally into something else. Of course, we paid attention to the housing, we looked at incremental housing, the housing for, because this is low income housing, it's like uh, 350 square feet a family and a little larger area for the elephant. So by making a courtyard, which you see as number four, and then a larger courtyard, which is number three, you actually increase the size of the house. So if three families can actually get along well, they have a mansion uh, uh, because it's a large space, because the open space can be used, and how does it sort of grow over time, uh, and moving away from the row house into the aggregated cluster, etc. And then, so this was, these are site visits. Uh, because, you know, elephants can't sleep on flat ground, they need a berm, because otherwise they can't get up. So you have to actually, the topography of their room is very important, and for different sizes, you need to do different things. And so these were how we would go to site and actually experiment. So it was really a lot of fun, and, you know, we haven't done a book on our project, and I always say, I'm going to have this on the cover and call it large, medium, small, you know, excellent. <laughs> I thought that would, could be a good title. It will be recognizable, if nothing else. Uh, and so this is when the project, kind of the first phase of the project, the first water body was built, and it began to retain uh, some water. Uh, sorry. Yeah, and then that's how the different clusters, that someone coming home, and every cluster is, is dealt with differently. Some people have grown grass, and some haven't. Uh, uh, you know, so now in Jaipur, which has a water shortage, where the middle class have to buy containers of water on a daily basis, the poorest in that society, because the Mahutans, 5,000 to 6,000 rupees, $100, a little bit on the tips, they actually have more water than they need, so they grow and sell flowers, they actually play out the middle class dream of having lawns and sprinklers and you know so they kind of it's a kind of by default it's an inversion of an inequity again we didn't start the project by saying we we're going to do this but the feedback tells us that if you make the right decisions through values that are not purely architectural but more abstract and have ambitions of social equity and pluralism and all of that which is what I preface the lecture with I think these results play themselves out because life you know life finally corrodes architecture which is something we don't accept so easily so now 
now they're cooking out because they can use the kitchen as an extra bedroom. They've retrofitted their own houses, and now the goats have arrived, the trees have grown. Uh, you know, there's life has taken it over, and one has to be accepting of that. Uh, and you know, it creates beautiful moments. Um, and now they've just been given ownership of these houses, so they'll start painting them and plastering them and appropriating and colonizing them. They didn't do it for 10 years because the governments had kept falling and coming, and no one had taken a decision on, on, on what to do. But just to give you a this is exactly the same view. But that was the transformation that occurred uh, only because we privileged water as the prime, and the dish antennas have arrived, and you know, of course, life has taken over. What they do is, like I said, they take tourists. I won't show you that one. Uh, but what the water did was. Uh, a couple of things. One is it, of course, improved the health of the elephant, which was very important. But this is the critical thing. The bonding between the mahout and the elephant is like, it's 100 times greater when they bathe together. Because that level of comfort that the elephant experiences with the mahout rubbing its skin down, and you just see them, I mean, they're just lazily lying around. That bonding becomes very critical to the operation of their relationship. Again, we didn't understand this. We were using water just to improve the health of these elephants. But this was one of the other fallouts. So, I mean, I, I want to be honest that these are not things we set out to do, but the question is we, the fact that we took a decision that we would like to imagine the project as an armature for life and a social condenser of some kind allowed all of this to happen and we are pleased to kind of observe this as we go on. Now we've got money from the government to do the pitching. These are all local species that have grown. You know, and they're also social beings. I mean, they've got to hang out together. If you keep them up, uh, apart for too long, they begin to get cranky and they can get out of control. So we had to make these pavilions where, you know, for a few hours in the day, they were tied together so they can hang out with their buddies and stuff. Now there was a new generation that began to emerge there, which were the teenagers, which are the sons of the Mahout, who are much more savvy with WhatsApp and Facebook and stuff. So they saw this as an opportunity, and they started a company called Elephantastic. I think you can go online, and they charge you 100 rupees to feed the elephants, and 500 rupees if you want to bathe with the elephant. And it's like become a hot thing. If you go to TripAdvisor and stuff, this appears, and you can actually make an appointment with them, because you know people then post these on their Facebook page, on Instagram, and stuff like that. So these guys understood that opportunity, and now there's a whole economy that comes out of that. You know, you can see his Elephantastic t-shirt and and people sort of just sort of fetchy young people come and hang around there. So now there's a kind of economy that's come out of it. Again, unintended. We, we didn't even think this would happen. But just because we recognized that these elephants had to hang out together, these kids saw that as an opportunity, which is again amazing. And this is a chart I recently made <laughs> to show you, you know, talking to the client, patron, and all of that. So the red line is, represents us, which is RMA Architects. We are pretty consistent, except we fade a little bit here because we run out of energy. Uh, this is the politicians, the patrons. This is the BJP party that appointed us, the Congress that rejects the project. The BJP comes back to power. They don't, I, I write to, these are all the letters I write every month to the chief minister, telling him, telling her why it's such an important project. She doesn't listen to me. And then we get a gold medal from the University of Ferrara with Glenn Merkett on the jury for the most sustainable project of the year, which I send to her in a frame. And I get a call from her. And I'm called in the meeting. Everyone's called into the room. And she gives them a 12-month deadline. And so we've now begun to, again, finish the project. So this is a documentation. And there are about 100 letters actually, I wrote every month, and we kept going to site on our own cost. It became a cross-subsidized project. But what's interesting is this, which is the agencies. Every few months, the agency changed. It started with the Public Works Department, the Tourism Department, the Forest Department, to the Zoo, the Zoo Authority, and so the operational client kept changing. So in this case, we were in touch with the users on a daily basis. They gave us lunch, they gave us tea when we went there, and we, with the users, were consistent to the project. And that really, in a sense, nurtured the project through it. Because these guys never even knew who each other. They never spoke to each other. And so this became a complex bridging. And we did this out of just our passion for it. But I'm now reflecting about it. To, that's how I've been able to unpack how I now see the client in a much more complex and nuanced way. Because I think that gives us the instrumentality which we would need otherwise. And so 
This is just an animation for the details, and uh, it just gives you the whole story from 2007 uh, to the present, which I did recently for a, for an exhibition. But uh, it's, it was very educative for me to to reflect on 12 years to see where the blockages, etc., were. And that's how it was when it was abandoned. Now it's come back to life. The fencing has been done. The green has been putting in the water troughs, more pavilions for the elephants to hang out in. The trees have already grown. Uh, a gateway has been done to define the project. We've got a ticketing booth and an information thing for tourists. Uh, we are looking at swales and different ways of retaining water. Uh, we've actually done a guest house, which we convinced the government it wasn't part of the program, which can allow conservationists, scholars, but also tourists who pay 400 or $500 to live in a room. There are just three or four rooms here with a little dining facility. It's very low key. It just sits there so that it doesn't disturb what's around it. You enter it through this door, uh, and it's just a courtyard. So it's, it's, it's complete privacy so that you don't feel like you're, you're intruding, but it, it begins to generate income. These are the wives of the Mahut, and that woman is from the tourism department. She's doing a training program because they run the guest house now. So it gives them income locally, and they look after it. And the furniture was all made locally. These are actually these are convicts from a local jail who participated in it. So it gave them income. They made beautiful furniture, very simple materials, so that it doesn't stand out or it's not obtrusive in that landscape. Or otherwise, very low income people who live. And this is what I mean. These are the first houses as they were given their. Um, Ownership, you can see there about 5,000 trees were planted in the last six or eight weeks. And people have begun, and the reason they're painting birds is because of the water in the trees. The birds that are coming there is just mind blowing. I mean, there are specialists who are now studying this. I know someone was writing a book on the birds at this elephant village because it has suddenly attracted uh, that uh, uh, population. And that's what it looks like in the lowest parts where it's really a forest. That's our ambition to create these swales and micro check dams to create wet and humidity to transform the landscape. And those buildings that were under disrepair and had been abandoned, we retrofitted with this pergola to make a school for the next generation, which are kids. There's actually an American NGO that is now running this school because there are about 50 kids uh, now, in, because there are about 100 families uh, that actually uh, live there. So you know, just to summarize, I'm going to take five more minutes, is that I think um, so for, for us, working in Mumbai in India has been about negotiating these global flows uh, so as not to erase and remake landscape, but to work in these kind of interstitial spaces. Uh, and the challenge is really how to make these different disparate worlds work together. How do you spatially configure them? It's not, for me, the binary of the city, of the rich, the poor, the formal, the informal, the private, the public, the government, the state, versus the private. But it's about all of this simultaneously uh, in this sort of kinetic space. And I think I think these binaries, which are often used to explain South and Central America, Asia, Africa, are non-productive for us as designers. It's a good way to explain the world, to explain the world around us, but we have to find ways that we can blur them. Because finally, design is about synthesis, about how space can enact that form of synthesis and blurring. And so the question for architects, conservationists, urban designers, planners becomes, how can we design for this space of blur? Can we design with a divided mind? And how, more importantly, how might we be inspired by the design intelligence of what I'm calling the kinetic city uh, and this landscape that we work in to construct soft thresholds, facilitate porosity, which is both social and physical. So a pluralistic society for me is one that accepts differences, but also goes beyond to understand and even be influenced by these differences in productive ways. That is to see the simultaneous validity of difference. Because once the architect, planner, conservationist sees these various differences as being simultaneously valid, the challenge then is how to go beyond the polarized binaries and make architecture which reflects that, that is, like I said, physically and visually porous. And this is truly the aspiration of our practice, and we are aware that many of the conditions I described are emblematic of the issue and the crisis we are facing in many parts of the globe. So it's, this is not just India. India is allowing me to reflect in a theoretical way about these problems in the contemporary world that we collectively uh, occupy, this sort of crisis of the intersection between our spheres of concern, which we are becoming better and better in articulating, but then becoming less effective in terms of the sphere of our instrumentality and our agency uh, and our influence. 
And I think articulating this crisis and, un and understanding and articulating it in terms that are useful for us as designers, I believe, is the first step. And we often don't articulate it in design terms, and we articulate it in different, um, in different ways. Because Paul Romeo, who Roma from the World Bank, said this beautifully. He said, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the lecture. That was wonderful. Um, the work was great. Um, one thing that it made me think about is from the turn of, let's say, the end of the 19th century with sort of Ebenezer Howard, Garden City, through the middle of the century, when we think about like CIAM and thinking about the functional city, there was a real engagement of architects with the project of the city because we describe the city as something that's functionally wrong, it needs to be cleaned up, and those are things that we can solve with forms, so we can make a garden city or make a radial city. And then in the second half of the 20th century, we see what happens with you know um, urban renewal and all of these issues when we try to just solve the city functionally. And it seems that what you're suggesting, and I think then architects back away from the city because we realize, uh-oh, life is very complicated. We can't just resolve it as a form. And I think we leave it to the landscape, to the urbanist. And I guess what I'm wondering is, if you want to re-engage architects in the city to create equity, what do we need to teach as different skill set? Well, that's like a, <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll do two quick responses, because this is like we could engage for an hour on this. Uh, and I hope in the next couple of days, some of us might talk more about it. But the two things that come to mind in, um, in, in, in response to what you're saying in a much broader way is one, you know, if we accept that theory is about reflecting on reality and then trying to discern those patterns to make sense for another generation or for other operators to kind of be guided, at least by a framework, uh, then I think you have to look at where the action is on the ground. And we are yet, I mean, you know, I teach this stuff, we are yet looking at theory that came out of the industrializing West and trying to apply it. And therefore, the crisis that you're precisely describing that, you know, in the functional city, et cetera, these were, so that's that continuity. So that's an amazing rupture. And I think that's the reason why, and I hope we can discuss this when we talk about ephemeral urbanism and things. It's not an alternative, but how do we infect the debate with these new realities and what that might mean? So I think that becomes a big question for pedagogy. What theory, for whom, where was the theory evolved from? What is the theory we should be evolving now? And of course, it will be a whole set of hybrids, but we've got to be looking on the ground where the action is. And, where, and the action is also in the US. It's a different kind of action. It's a quieter and perhaps dystopic kind of condition, which also we can, you know, whether it's the shrinking city or the disparities. Or this, this, so it's, I, I'm not saying it means only Asia or China. But you're going to find new ways of reflecting on what's happening on the ground and then kind of coming up with theory for that, you know, which might help us answer the kind of questions. The other thing that comes to mind is something my colleague and Erkin's previous colleague, Jean Bosquets, has a beautiful diagram. And maybe I'll pull that out and I'll show it tomorrow. Where he says that, you know, traditionally the city was about urbanization, whether it was a king or someone who decided that you'd open up land. It was urbanization, plot division, and building, right? Uh, then he said, by the time you get to the garden city, uh, it becomes uh, urbanization and plot division collapse into one, in the way I was showing you the client, and the building becomes individual houses that people can build because the ensemble is decided. Then by the time you come to housing estates, which developers do now, uh, gated communities or whatever you might call them, actually uh, uh, urbanization, plot division, and building collapse and it becomes one and it's delivered together. But actually what, what we call the informal city and the reality in most parts of the world is the reverse. You have building, then that's followed by urbanization. That's followed by plot division because you regularize plots. Governments do that, and then you have urbanization, which is bringing sanitation. And so it's a complete reversal. Uh, and so what is? And of course, there's a lot of theory around that, but a lot of the theory isolates, I believe. And I'm saying this in a very kind of fresh way because I've just come out of a three-day seminar, which we call the slum to look at some of these questions. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway from that conference, which had 20 people, all the way from the World Bank to practitioners, was that 
the discussion about slums or informal city has isolated it too much from the rest of the city. Uh, and how do you resituate it is the biggest challenge, not how you upgrade it. There's enough stuff done on that, and that depends on how you understand the patron client and you know the operational client. But I think in that whole discussion, and that's why the binary is uh, not useful, because that becomes two separate things, and that's not what designers, I believe, are supposed to do. And I mean designers in the broadest sense. And we can talk about this model. Those would be my two responses to what you asked. Is there a deliberate position towards kind of organization of labor? You know, the, you didn't sort of explicitly talk about it. You sort of touched upon, you know, the sort of the gardeners and office workers kind of. Be, but then before that, you also talked about, uh, you know, how this sort of um, this facade, this kind of large thing, got produced from out of this small thing. You know, there is the sort of three-year process, and and then. In the elephant village too, there is this sort of like different modes of labor kind of yeah. emerged and then came together. I I, don't, I didn't know whether there was some sort of thing. You know, that. to be very honest, uh, one hasn't reflected on it enough to articulate a position. One has, I think, intuitively engaged in different conditions in different ways. Um, I, I think the 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 structural organization of the general contractor uh, and everything else is the business as usual model uh, in India. And fortunately or unfortunately, all our projects have been subject to that. Now, in some cases, we've managed to break that and actually begin to engage with components of the general contractor, which means, uh, so for example, in the, in the building with the green for sound, the corporate building, uh, the general contractor was pushing the client to actually do glazing, then pushing the client to go to a, a large company that does extruded aluminum uh, so that we could have, if they want to do this aluminum facade, we know how to do it, we'll do it for you in three weeks. And so that's the point where we sometimes detach bits of it, and for many reasons. So in this case, the reason was we felt we'd get a better crafted facade, because it'd have a texture, we could mold it, it wasn't just the extruded section. We also had a relationship with a contractor who, in fact, the poster that you've used for my lecture with those screens in metal, that contractor actually helped us construct those screen metals out of scrap waste from a machine tool company. So we knew he had the passion, the interest, the skills to do this. So we thought we'd engage him and we'd you know, experiment with textures. And so we detached that process. It was very tedious. But then once we detached it within that gamut, the relationship we could have with the labor, the way we could organize it, the fact that he got women involved because it was a light thing which could be dealt with, women, you know, so, so the whole, it changes a subculture within it. Now, maybe, I mean, and the reason we fought for that one mold instead of 10 is now it's allow, allowed him to survive in the business. So he's now actually producing the stuff for many other architects. So I don't know, one will have to reflect about this, I'm being very honest. So I would, the, the short answer to that would be that within different projects, there's some operations of different formations of labor that we've kind of engaged with, so very specialized things. And it's hard to break the general contractor mode. We haven't yet moved into the project manager and vendor mm -hmm. pattern of the US, which everyone's pushing to do. Uh, um, but most 90% of the projects we worked on is with the general contractor because I believe that gives us a way that we can make a relationship and spin off some of these operations. Yeah. And then of course there are a whole lot of other issues which have to do with exploitation of labor, which is what Pratap Banu Mehta's uh, thing was, safety and women and helmets and you know just all harnesses and that is another big kind of um, operation and of course we try to insist, we see it very much as our responsibility uh, and you know you make those as incremental changes as you go along and it's getting much much better and much more professional. Uh, in the beginning, you had briefly alluded to how all of your publications over time have um, influenced, I think, have um, have influenced policy, particularly in Bombay. Um, could you speak a little bit about how um, you know that's taken place, uh, particularly in the context of these uh, recent projects that you discussed, and how your own reflection upon completion, in hindsight has shown you uh, you know, a lot of these additional layers to those projects that you didn't think about. So you know, is there a policy connect there? Maybe not direct policy. So I think in some cases, the publications, as I mentioned, were clearly instruments of advocacy. And I, I believe that 
what happens is, again, this is part of the binary that you know you become an advocate planner and an advocate architect. And, and I think there's an in-between, which is we also have the ability to produce these instruments for advocacy and sometimes not engage in the advocacy ourselves. And that is also a useful bridge. So in the case of the historic district in Mumbai, which I'll talk about day after tomorrow, we were doing both. We were the advocates, we were the planners, we were the lobbyists, and we were also making the instruments. And that's why I pulled that one out to flag it out. In the others, it's much more complicated. Uh, it is about, so in the case, well, so say, let's say, that, uh, let me just take the book on architecture in India since 1990. I think that might be what you might be more directly. I would not say it would have an influence on policy. Maybe it will eventually, I don't know. But it was just a new way of trying to look at architecture. 1990s when I started my practice. And it's when the book starts, it's also when we liberalized our economy, so there was a lot happening. And I thought one should write a book that one is about stuff one has experienced. So going back to reflecting on what one saw on the ground. So everyone I've covered, there are people I've had personal relationships with, I've shared their struggles, I've argued with them, and not spoken to them for weeks and months because they were doing rubbish, you know, etc. But it made me, I mean, I was saying to you over lunch that really what that book did was challenge and uh, some, again, a default condition that architecture in India, because of Cobb and Louis Kahn and then the next generation, was always uh, discerned and judged through the lens of modernism. And that book was about removing the lens of modernism and what you saw, and it was incredible what you saw. And I mean, I'm happy to talk about the book too, one of these days if you have time. Uh, were bizarre things, were things where ancient images were resurfacing. Modernism wasn't really, 1% of the buildings being built were using, using the aesthetic of modernism that we celebrate in the Western press especially. And so that made me think about pluralism, it made me think about uh, getting rid of the baggage of aesthetic consistency, so while discerning eyes can see a consistency in our project, actually they're quite different in terms of, you know, maybe the sensibilities uh, they bring, whether we use a sloping roof or we use flats. I mean, we, we respond to a project based on, so it made me reignite my own understanding and passion about regionalism, about locality, uh, about a whole host of things. How that will affect policy, I don't know. But I think the results from it, like the exhibition on the state of our housing, the state of architecture, has begun to set those conversations up. So what the state of housing, our state of architecture did, we decided, I co-curated with two other friends, we said we were not going to include single family homes and uh, weekend houses. Uh, and we broadened that category to say we were not going to include in the exhibition the architecture of indulgence. So it doesn't have boutiques, it doesn't have boutique hotels, it doesn't have resorts, it doesn't have any of that. And we said, if we eliminated that, which is what 90% of the pages of the magazines are filled with, what do we see? And we did actually curate an amazing set of projects, which had to do with veterinary hospitals, had to do with crematoriums, which all went below the radar, because not because they were not beautiful buildings, but they were not people who were not looking for those things, correct? And architects too. And so there were two results of that. One, it actually, well, one is that we made a lot of enemies, because every well-known architect, most, well-known practices, names you might recognize here, have built their practices on weekend homes, where the, where the client collapses, and you know it's really the architecture of indulgence in some way, especially given our condition in India. So it made that very clear that there was a other whole constituency of architects who were building, perhaps in more meaningful ways, or engaging with wicked problems. And the other thing that it did was it it showed us how diminished our role in society and our voice as architects in society was uh, in terms of what was actually being produced either by developers directly or etc cetera, etc cetera. and a lot of the infographics etc made these arguments like the real estate i mean there were about 100 stories i can tell you just from that one infographic that emerged so that changed the conversation i mean i know uh, the committee was set up by the Council of Architects to examine education, and some of it successfully, some not it. But it, the fact is, it started the conversation. So then, two years later, we said, if we made such a judgment of the profession, what might be the aspect of where the profession could really focus its energy? And we thought it was housing. So that's where the next exhibition was in the state of housing, where we documented 80 types in great detail, all the way from independence to the present. It's going to be produced as a two-volume book by the end of the year and did two major conferences to bring all the voices on 
policy and econo economists and architects and planners to talk about the crisis of housing and where. So hopefully now something like that, it's critical of the Pradhan Mantri Ayojan, which is the uh, Prime Minister's uh, housing scheme, which, uh, you know, again, like these absolute solutions, he's promised he's going to solve the housing problem by, I think, 2020. Uh, and it, at the rate that they have delivered housing in the last four years, we calculated it will take 132 years to meet that target. So you know these are all. So a lot of this kind of truth. Again, talk about truth and fake news and what's happening around the world in politics. We just felt that within the profession, if we had these voices that actually articulated these positions, it might have an impact. Now, it's less direct as in the conservation of a precinct, as you well know. Uh, but one can only hope that it will have an impact. But uh, but I, I can't uh, take credit for anything direct as I can for the conservation stuff. Yeah. Is there any questions? I think we could just thank Travel for this.